As the group was slowly making their way across the swamp, Zorja and Malharath caught a glimpse of something moving in the shadows. As soon as their heads swiveled around, more than a dozen snake-like figures busted out of the thick cover and surrounded them. Yuan Ti. The heroes have been warned about their looming presence. Now they will have to face the feared slave masters of the swamp. Maktor and Malharath wasted no time and immediately engaged in a bloody melee with the assailants. Masato was bobbing and weaving away from many Yuan Ti scimitars, arrows, and poisonous bites. Galvin unleashed his potent psychic and thunderous magic, but he was unable to maintain focus on his most powerful spells, getting interrupted by cuts and bite wounds inflicted by the enemies. Faced with these overwhelming odds, Zoria knew that there was only one way to avoid getting captured or worse, killed by the snake people. Channeling her most powerful conjuration spell, the muddy bog water around her started bubbling and splashing, forming into elongated beast shapes. Eight bulky anacondas and reticulated pythons solidified and took form in the pockets of open space in the near vicinity. Immediately following the casting of her spell, Zorja looked at the snakes and started producing strange sounds with her mouth and trunk. The large constrictors appeared to understand her and started lunging at the Yuan Ti, constricting and squeezing their bodies. Last but not least, she formed the protective bear spirit aura in the middle of this chaos, invigorating her allies and summons with additional vitality and bol bolstering their physical strength to the peak capacity. Focus fire, please. These snakes will still get up pretty fast. Zorja trumpeted at her companions. With a surge of new life and friendly constrictors coiling themselves around the swamp marauders, the heroes switched from desperate defensive maneuvers to a full-blown counter-assault, felling and slaying a lot of the Yuan Ti very quickly. The few who escaped the grasp of the anacondas and the powerful strikes of the heroes turned around and started running away. Masato started running after them, but Zorja trumpeted at him immediately. Let them run! They will tell their kin what happened and they won't harass us ever again. Maktor and Malharath, still enraged, immediately protested, but she calmly told them to collect themselves. We are not here to fight, Yuan Ti. We are here to explore the rumors of the portal, remember? Now, now, let's take a little break and keep moving forward. Still a bit disgruntled, both hotheads gave up trying to argue with her, Knowing she doesn't change her views easily, Masato and Galving nodded in, in approval and started inspecting the dead bodies as they usually do. Zorja was almost certain this skirmish was just the beginning of their troubles, but she kept her feelings to herself, at least for a while. Alright everybody, um, a new video, so uh, if you like this intro story, it's not very long compared to my uh, most recent ones, but I think it's very thematic and it makes sense for this particular character uh, that we have today. So uh, yeah, like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button, let me know if you liked it, um, let me know what you think the rest of the video once you watch it. So uh, yeah, with that said, uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank all of my patrons. So Andreas, a finger in the bum, uh, I like the name. Matthew Ewing, uh, thank you for your uh, $30 uh, pledge, uh, you, these three gentlemen are the, well, I think a finger in the bum is a gentleman, he might be a, or she might be a girl, who knows, by the name I would say, <laughs> it's a gentleman, um, so yeah, uh, thank you for your uh, support, thank you for uh, deciding to play in my online campaign, for all of you other people who uh, maybe not don't know or who are still maybe on the fence, uh, there's still six days left for you to join the online campaign. Uh, the summer deal, the special offer still uh, lasts until the end of June. So if you, if 
you want, if you're interested, uh, check out my uh, my video before this one, and uh, yeah, you will uh, you will see and uh, hear a little bit more details about that. But yeah, with that said, back to the list. Brad Oldham, Joe, JT, Ya Boy Fox, Brian Moten, Sean, Corey Williams, Jeremy Helton, Kyle McPhee, Joel C. Alcazar, Will Ketterer, Kevin Ehring, Boy, Zachary Bradley, Rich Million, Dark Sin, Gary Kors, Matthew Collins, Albert Kwok, uh, Victor e. Query, Victor Query, Caleb Ellis, Matthews, Rudy, Simon Pedersen, Suburban Hell, Blaze Ridge, and finally Frank Fan. Thank you for your support, all the new and old uh, patrons and all the future ones. Uh, thank you for all of your support. With that said, let's quickly go over the basics of the video. So what are the basics of the video? Basically, the idea is just to take the ordinary Shepherd Druid with all its awesome uh, features surrounding uh, the synergy with the summoning spells and just uh, rev it up to the max. So, uh, first and foremost, I would say that uh, this is sort of like, in terms of a racial choice, definitely a build that might not be possible in a decent amount of games, but if your DM allows a Loxodon race, I would definitely, definitely recommend taking Loxodon. First and foremost, you get uh, uh, racial bonuses in two abilities that matter to you, which are both Constitution and Wisdom will matter to you. On low and high levels and you also get a feature which is called natural armor basically your armor class is uh, uh, calculated cal calculated based on your constitution uh, ability score ability modifier so yeah basically you have 12 plus constitution we will be uh, this build revolves around maxing out your constitution because uh, you have a couple of spells which are concentration and that are very very important for this build uh, so yeah constitution actually matters uh, feats wise we have resilient and warcaster the duo of the feats which are uh, very potent on any build that relies on any type of concentration spell uh, we have the spirit totem of the bear now why bear bear is probably the best of the three spirits that you can get uh, for the fact that you add 5 plus your druid level temporary hit points as well as uh, giving advantage on strength checks and saving throws while creatures are in the aura. Uh, we have the mighty summoner feature uh, which furthermore uh, grants you additional hit points on top of the temporary hit points of the bear spirit. Um, as well as giving all of your summons, all of the fey and uh, beast creatures that you summon, that you conjure or just uh, create by your spells, uh, they now, uh, their damage is considered magical in order to circumvent the uh, immunity or resistance to non-magical attacks and damage. Uh, Guardian Spirit, uh, a level 10 feature, fairly high level but still, ve still very very potent, uh, while within the range of the aura, and the aura itself has uh, 30 feet of range, radius, right? Um, the, uh, your your creatures, your fey and beast creatures that you summon with your conjuration spells, uh, they get healed for half of your druid level every single turn, every single round, right? Um, this is very, very potent because by the time you get this feature, that means uh, at the bare minimum, the, the, monster, uh, the beasts and fey will be healing for five hit points every single turn, every single round. That's just a lot of passive healing, which requires no action, no action economy if you're from your part. This is very, very powerful. In terms of spells, we have our uh, trusty Absorb Elements, a level 1 Abjuration Defensive spell, which will serve as uh, sort of like, not not like, not against all types of damage, but a lot of type, a lot of damage in uh, D&D 5e, especially... Uh, area of effect damage is elemental type of damage fire cold acid uh, that type thunder lightning so uh, this spell will serve as a reactionary spell to half the damage that you take which is going to be important for maintaining concentration on conjure animals maybe conjure woodland beings uh, giant insect conjure fey uh, or even shape change when, once you hit level 17. So yeah, these spells are sort of like especially conjure animals a, a third level which you get starting at level 5 of your druid, level 5 of your character. Um, 
very very potent spell just for the fact that your your summons are getting healed they have a bunch of temporary hit points from the bear spirit aura they get a bunch of additional hit points based on the hit dies that they have and their damage is considered natural uh, magical it's just crazy crazy synergy in tier 2 and tier 3 and finally in tier 4 you are as powerful as any other druid with those 8th and 9th level spells such as shape change that's probably the most uh, the, like the sickest spell of them all it's a 9th level spell which allows you to turn right into any cr 17 to 20 creature finally we have beast spells and arch druid which are uh, our 18th and 20th level uh, features uh, both are good arch druid is just downright sick maybe even broken because you can uh, wild shape unlimited amount of times while you are in your animal form you don't care about any any components uh, even if you are in your normal like loxodon humanoid form you you still ignore all the somatic and material components this is just all around very very like probably one of the most not probably definitely one of the most powerful level 20 capstone features if not even the most powerful of them all but that's a topic of discussion for maybe another video another time so yeah basically the defining characteristics clearly uh, this class this subclass this particular type of druid has some of the buffest summons in the whole game like the amount of additional hit points temporary and extra hit points that you get based on your bear aura and the mighty summoner is just downright broken like uh, I don't know, you can have 37 hit points on a, on a CR one quarter feet uh, beast. That's just that's just insane. Um, yeah, even more. Like it, it just, just depends on your level. Like if you're level, I don't know, depends on your druid level. Like if if you're a higher level druid, the, it it can have 40, 45, right? It's just crazy how many hit points those beasts have. Uh, this just obliterates the majority of conventional tier 2 and 3 encounters. Doesn't suffer from low AC like most druids. Um, you start out like at the at the bare bare minimum with, with this uh, point by pr uh, distribution. You start out with a plus 3. Plus, uh, 12 plus 3 is 15. And then you add a shield on top of that. You start out with 17 armor class. At level 4 you bump up, bump this to 18, so you have 18, and finally you have 19 at some point, which is very very high for a druid, like druids are known, especially in games where DMs enforce the rule about not wearing any armor that contains any metal parts, that includes studded leather, like uh, druids are known for having low AC, they suffer from it, this particular one, just based on your race, and the fact that uh, you will be uh, focusing on constitution as your actual primary ability means that your AC is going to be very, very high. And uh, thanks to all of that, you're actually going to be fairly tanky in tier 1 and even in tier 2. Like, AC is known to not scale well into higher levels when monsters have uh, very high accuracy bonuses. But in level, like in tier 1 and 2, like from level 1 to 10, your AC is gonna be high enough for you to even be able to, to like, be a, be an off tank, a secondary tank. So yeah, basically, all in all, it's a very, it's another one of those single class builds, which I, I think this is my second single class build on this channel, but I mean, it's so powerful that I think it deserves a spot, at least like a, a video dedicated to it. And let me tell you, I played this character online uh, from level 3 to level 6 in a sort of like a West Marches server. Um, so yeah, shout out to the uh, hub server. Um, yeah, you enabled me to test this uh, character and it's very, very powerful. So yeah, shout out to all of you. If you are watching the video, you know who you are. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's very, very powerful. Like I, th I knew that it's powerful, but I still thought that Moon Druid is better. After playing this particular build, like I legit took, I, I legit played this like word for word, like stat for stat. I played this particular build up until level six uh, so far. Um, it. I just don't think there's anything in the game in terms of combat which which can come even close to this 
at least in tier two and three, right? I don't. I, I mean, I haven't tested it in tier, in high levels like tier uh, late level, late tier three and tier four. But like, you're just a druid. Like, l druids are known to, for like those higher level spells and uh, spell slots that they get. They just they scale so well into the late game, and especially with the Ars druid feature that, uh, yeah, I mean. This this will work regardless of what level you're playing at, and um, the potential for this to be used and abused is very 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 high. Now basically that's about it. Um, not nothing other uh, to the build other than this. This I like the key features and defining characteristics of the build. Um, if you'd like to, if you'd like for me to explain a in a little bit more detail about all of these uh, little nitty gritty features and spells. You are free to proceed uh, watching the rest of the video for all of you veterans and people who already know what I'm talking about and already have a couple of ideas in your own head. Please leave a comment down below, tell me if maybe you figure out a way for this to work even better than I uh, made it work. And I think it works pretty pretty well in just this particular iteration, so yeah. Uh, like the video, leave a comment, share, subscribe, hit the bell button, make sure to come back when I release new videos. Uh, again, if you are interested in playing in one of my high-level campaigns, uh, go to my Patreon page. There's six days left of the summer deal. It's pretty good deal. Four times per four times per month, like once a week, we are gonna have a session, and it's gonna be pretty fast in terms of character progression. It's gonna be it's gonna be combat, exploration, uh, social encounters, all of that. So yeah, join me if you're interested. With that said. Uh, that's the end of the short, short, right, uh, quotation marks, overview of the video, and uh, for all of you newer players and people who just uh, j joined the hobby and maybe just come to this channel for the first time in their lives, if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about this build, uh, keep watching. So yeah, uh, what what is actual, uh, what is actual driving engine behind this build? Well, like, the main, main uh, spell of this build is Conjure Animals. Um, how is that gonna work? Well, we already we already discussed, like, in brief details uh, about uh, these features that matter. First and foremost, Loxodon. I think, in terms of racial choices, you can choose other races. Loxodon is not the only race which offers constitution and wisdom. But I think Loxodon works the best just for the fact that you get natural armor which provides 12 plus con modifier and you will be maxing out your constitution just because you rely on, cons on concentration spells so much in combat. Like that's your thing, that's the one thing you do, you conjure animals, you conjure woodland beings. Those are the spells that are very important for this build to work. That's like all of your, all of your subclass druid features work around a conjuration summoning spells. So yeah, I think in terms of racial choice, again, Loxodon is pretty much the best, best option there. And unfortunately, if your DM doesn't allow Loxodons, there are alternatives such as, I don't know, uh, Genasi, I think, has an alternative where you can, I think it's fire, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's water Genasi, it will still work with the same, uh, uh, sort of, uh, with the exact same racial bonuses, but obviously different features. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there are alternatives, but Loxodon is the way to go, in my opinion. Um, uh, I would start out with this distribution, uh, just for the fact that some of the fees that you will get later on, we already uh, covered those, uh, they are gonna matter, and they will come into play. Uh, you get these other features, such as powerful build, this will be neat, you will be able to carry two times more. Uh, Loxodon Serenity is very, very decent as well, because you have advantage on Charmed and Frightened, against Charmed and Frightened. You live kind of long, you have standard movement speed, uh, the trunk is actually pretty interesting uh, because uh, it kind of on the surface looks like a ribbon feature, but if you think about it, um, even though the limb lacks sort of like dexterity and precision, um, and you can only do like crude, crude types of uh, activities with it such as lift, drop, hold, push or pull, if you think about it, uh, Loxodons don't have dark vision, so at least a one you one legitimate use for the trunk is being able to hold a torch while in total darkness, a lit torch, and still be able to hold both the shield and the 
staff, druidic staff, the, the focus of your spells in your other hand. So if you think about it, in most situations you have two hands, um, you can carry a torch in one and a shield in another, and then in that situation sort of like you you see around but you can't cast spells because you don't have your druidic focus, your your focus for spells. Well, in terms of this, you have a trunk, so it's sort of like a third appendage, additional limb that uh, you can use to at least carry a torch. Like, and again, as the feature says, you can you can smack stuff with it, and uh, yeah, whenever that annoying gombly com comes at your feet, just smack it with your trunk. Um, keen smell is very very useful because it's not just perception, like usual with keen smell. Um, traits, racial traits, but you also get advantage on wisdom, survival and intelligent investigation checks that involve smell. Uh, this will come out of combat in like uh, exploration, social encounter uh, scenarios very very often. Uh, make sure you don't forget about this feature, the DM will forget that you have this. So whenever you are faced with some kind of research, exploration, solving mysteries, puzzles, whatever, Ask your DM whether your sense of smell can uh, figure figure anything around, like at least give you advantage on uh, one of those three uh, skill checks. Finally, you have a locks done in common. Uh, makes sense for a, for a kind of like elephant in race to have their own language, and obviously every race speaks common. Uh, in terms of background, now this is another. This build is going to be controversial on many fronts, at least a little bit. I'm not gonna say inconsistent, but it's gonna depend on your DM a lot. Uh, we already covered the race, but then we have the background. I think uh, with the release of uh, Ravnica, uh, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, and uh, the release of the eight backgrounds, which not only give you the like the additional background choices for your character, they actually include additional layer of mechanical benefits, and uh, they the, the mechanical benefits are if you are a member of one of these guilds, right? That's the if you are a Zorius functionary member, like if you are a Zorius Senate member, uh, you get access to these expanded list of spells, which are added to your spell list. Um, yeah, you can see how this is probably like this is just like objectively better than any other background in player's handbooks, sword course adventures guide, uh, any other book that has any backgrounds for fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. Talk to your DM, ask him if he will let you just use uh, these types of back. Like you can even come up with a custom background like this, but. I mean, obviously, the spell selection here is going to be a major point of, uh, like, it could be a major issue. So, yeah, talk to your DM, ask him or her whether uh, he or she will let you use these backgrounds. I would say, particularly in the case of Azorius Functionary, while thematically not the best fit, because druids are not the type of class who are, like, lawful, stupid, like paladins. They are more like neutral, neutral goods, sort of like that. It's still decent enough in terms of theme to at least make some, some, somewhat of a sense. But mechanically, it provides you with a counter spell, um, and this is actually very, very good in your case because one way to shut this shut a uh, shepherd the druid down is just to have a spellcaster on a battlefield within 60 feet. Who is simply gonna cast counter spell, and then your one trick, your var one very very powerful trick, which is conjure animals, uh, is just gonna shut down by a by a counter spell, uh, and you can do nothing about it. So in that case, I'd say if you can get access to this spell, which is normally not on a druid list, um, get it, uh, get it prepared, get it ready, it's just in case uh, DM decides to drop those spell casters with counter spells. So uh, that that you can counter spell their own counter spells, which is which is possible. Like it's it's definitely you you can do that uh, by rules as written uh, by the design of the game. You can definitely do it. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, you get decent skills like intimidation. It's not gonna matter to you, but insight is good because it goes off of wisdom and all these other features. They can come and play if they do. If if you can't get this, um, you can definitely get Faction Agent. It's another one of those. It's a similar 
background to Azorius functionary in principle because you're by by being Azorius functionary you're, you're basically a faction agent right a guild agent but here you can choose like all sorts of skills based on intelligence wisdom or charisma any any one of those uh, plus insight and obviously like what other skill will you choose other than perception because it's the like legitimately one of the most useful if not the most useful most important skills in the game uh these other features they are not that critical for the build but they are nice to have like like any other background right finally uh enough of the backgrounds right that's it like you can as i always say you can choose whatever background you want but mechanically in terms of mechanics I think uh, these two make the most sense because skill-wise, spell-wise, if, if it's allowed, um, they, they are the best thing uh, that you can do uh, for optimization of this class, for like most, to get most out of it. Uh, in terms of feats, I think this is like, I don't know how many times I've talked about the combo of Resilient and uh, Warcaster. Resilient basically gives you... You can choose the ability which you gain proficiency in saving throws with and in your case due to the fact that you start with 17 in constitution uh, you put plus one to constitution and now you are proficient with it so you have plus three plus four as your modifier with a proficiency bonus you have at least a plus two plus three or even more based on your uh, character level uh, so yeah, this is very very powerful on, on, on its own because first it gives you more hit points Second every time you have to make a concentration saving throw uh, to maintain concentration on a spell You now have additional plus two plus three plus four or five or six modifier based on your level And also don't forget again your armor class goes off of your constitution 12 plus con modifier so I, so increasing your modifier by one increasing your armor increases your armor class by one warcaster another one of those feats uh not only are you proficient uh, in your constitution saving throws every time you have to ma uh, make a concentration save which involves a constitution saving throw you now have advantage um when you take damage uh now this advantage will not come in play if you have a if you have to roll a constitution saving throw if you didn't take damage but those constitution saving throws to maintain concentration are actually dc of 10 by rules as written so at one point you will be auto passing those but more on that later um you can perform the somatic components of spells even if you have weapons and shield in both of your hands this is very neat because you have a shield and a druidic focus so uh, yeah, you actually don't have uh, your hands free. And finally, this is also very, very important. You can uh, basically cast spells on opportunity attacks. And in your particular case, you will be using a cantrip because why would you waste a spell slot, right? If you can just cast a cantrip. Uh, there's a very neat druid uh, cantrip called Thorn Whip, which is a melee cantrip with a decent, decent range. Um, and also ignoring the freehand rules, right, obviously for the spell components, that's neat too. Finally, enough of the feats and the backgrounds, let's get into the juice of the matter. Let's get into some of these druid features. First and foremost, we have the classic uh, the starting abilities, starting proficiencies and all of that jazz. It's very important that you get, it's very good, that you get a saving throw with wisdom uh, and also intelligence. Intelligence saving throws actually come up uh in uh, in uh, later later parts of the game like at higher levels more and more uh like more and more monsters invoke uh, intelligence saving throws so you being proficient in both of these is actually a very very good thing mentals mental saving throws intelligence wisdom and charisma actually matter more in the late game than in early game early game is more about like decks and the con saves uh, but yeah, you will be proficient in con at least and wisdom is also very very good uh, Spell casting wise uh, you have your uh, typical full caster, which is wisdom based Wisdom is your spell casting ability now uh, In your case your uh, the ability that is going to matter for your spells is constitution as I already uh, explained uh, previously, but uh, wisdom is still gonna matter uh, in, in late tier 3 and in tier 4 because 
let's let's be honest like those higher level spells level seven eight and nine they some of them invoke saving throws and they have powerful powerful effects so yeah wisdom maxing out your wisdom eventually is gonna be important as well uh you can you prepare spells you don't learn them so you can every day uh, after a long rest you choose which spells you will be able to cast at uh during that particular uh, adventuring day uh, this means that you can have a different uh, spell list uh, a different set of prepared spells every other day this is very very neat uh they also uh, this also means that uh, maxing out your wisdom again matters because the higher your wisdom modifier it, it stacks with your druid level right so wisdom modifier plus your druid level that's how many spells you can prepare each day finally you have a ritual casting uh being able to cast spells that have ritual tag is good because you don't have to waste your spell slots and finally spell casting focus is a druidic focus in your case it's basically a staff which can uh, serve as a quarter staff but you really won't be using quarter staff to smack fools in melee. You will be mostly using like thorn whip because it makes the more it, it makes more sense to do it that way. Um, wild shape. I mean, every druid has this feature. For you, it's not gonna be that important. Uh, just because it into it requires action. You are uh, not a moon druid who can wild shape using bonus action. And who can uh, turn into higher challenge rating critters. You're basically gonna be eventually uh, limited by challenge rating 1 beasts. Uh, they are decent. Uh, at level 8 you, you will be able to choose flying or swimming speed. So every type of beast is fair game. But um, not until level 20 when you get those uh, unlimited wild shapes. Basically this is like a 2 times per short rest. Um... Yeah, uh, it, it's 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 decent. You will be able to, if if the opportunity allows, turn into some kind of like very very small spider or a bug and just hide into a crack of the wall while concentrating on uh, on your conjure animals or conjure woodland beings or any of other summoning spells, which uh, summon one of those like par those powerful beasts and fey, right? Um, yeah, that's about it. Speech of the woods. Um, it's, I mean, this is a very decent, like, thematic feature, which can actually be very useful as well, because you can speak with beasts, right? There are a lot of low-level druid spells which sort of give you the ability to speak with beasts, and you have to waste your spell slots to do that. Uh, with this feature, you can just uh, bypass all of that. You can speak with beasts, they can communicate back to you. You also learn one language... This is like all around good feature. Probably not very powerful, but a very, very good utility to have nevertheless. Uh, Spirit Totem, this is like one of your power, power features. This is this is gonna matter from level 2 to level 20, trust me. Regardless of the aura that you take, even Hawk Spirit in at times can be useful because what if you're fighting a bunch of uh, enemies who are using bonus action to, uh, to hide, right? Well... You can give yourself and your allies advantage on perception checks to detect the presence of those enemies. And now all of a sudden those enemies will have harder time staying hidden from you. So yeah, all of these three uh, spirits are gonna matter. But for you in particular, in most cases, the bear spirit will be the most important one of these. Even though the unicorn spirit is also... it comes close. I'm not gonna say it's as good. Uh, but it's very good as well because in certain cases you just have to like go full on YOLO heal everything everybody right uh, But the bear spirit provides uh, 5 plus your druid level temporary hit points so At level 2 you, you give everybody uh, 7 hit points including yourself right at level 5 when you get those uh, Summoning spells uh, like conjure animals, right? You get 10 like you give your beast your summons 10 temporary hit points as you keep leveling up You give more and more um, Advantage on strength checks and saving throws is very good for grappling and escaping like some of those uh, I don't know Very good for even characters that have like low strength like minus one to strength now you give them advantage They have better odds of succeeding on those strength saving throws and oftentimes, uh, a lot of characters dump strength, and uh, yeah, this will actually, in, in, in a lot of situations, save a lot of those characters' asses, 
So yeah, I mean, it's just all around good. Nothing else to say about it. Unicorn Spirit, again, it's more about healing. Uh, every time you heal, you, you provide like passive healing to everybody else. It's not much healing, but it's 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 decent. Uh, it's decent enough because it goes off your druid, le druid level. So every time you cast healing word, you heal everybody else for like five, six, ten hit points. That's that's actually a lot of healing with just like a single casting of a first level spell that on its own heals like one d four plus three plus four, which is not really that much. Um, so yeah, I would say these two auras are primarily uh, your uh, targets. With Hawk Spirit uh, coming into play occasionally. Uh, I'm not gonna delve, uh, spend more time on that uh, than this. I think you, you get the picture. Uh, you get 5 ability score improvements. Uh, a standard distribution uh, like most other classes. Four, level 4, level um, 8, 12, 16 and 19. Constitution is actually more important to you than Wisdom because uh, all summoning spells, that sh that's what you do. You use summoning spells, require concentration. And uh, maxing Wisdom is more important later in tier 3 and 4 when you have to diversify your spellcasting just a little bit more. You cannot really rely on uh, conjure animals and, and woodland beings for like the entirety of your level 5 to level 20 career, right? Uh, at level 6 you get another very powerful feature which you already covered at the beginning of the video. Um, the, hit, uh, the increased hit points are nice but uh, the second paragraph like the second bullet point is way 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 more powerful. Uh, this feature is gonna matter so much in, t in late tier 2 and uh, in, in the entirety of tier 3 and even in tier 4 like sometimes you will just want to overwhelm the enemies with the action economy just like spam 32 beasts with your uh, uh conjure animals and just try to restrain everything and everybody kill everything and everybody as fast as possible so dealing uh dealing full amount of damage uh, bypassing immunities and resistances to non-magic attacks and damage is why this particular druid is so so powerful with those summoning spells because let's be honest like uh, the higher your character level, the more instances you are fighting against monsters that have resistances to non-magical attacks and damage. And some monsters even have immunities. Like, it, it, it's more and more often that you get across those monsters the higher level that your character is. So, this is very, very, very potent. Uh, level 10, uh, you get your Guardian Spirit. Uh, I mean, if you... Like... You can, uh, why I said Unicorn Spirit is good, uh, first and foremost, if you if you do the Unicorn Spirit and start casting healing words every turn, um, you, you are effectively going to be healing your, uh, starting from level 10, you're effectively going to be healing everybody for like 15 hit points, like all of your summons, because if they uh, uh, end the turn in the Spirit Totem Aura, they heal for 5 at least, uh, half of your Druid level. Well, you get this at level 10, so 5 at least. And then on top of that you cast the Healing Word, and then all of those summons get healed for like additional 15 hit points. Uh, 10 hit points, right? It's 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 just... it's the, the amount of healing you can do is crazy. It's rivaling that of a, of a Life Cleric oftentimes. Because like a single casting of a healing word can heal so much in a, like a, a huge radius. Uh, you really don't want to sleep on Unicorn Spirit at times, especially if you are fighting a lot of uh, a lot of spellcasters or monsters that are dropping uh, AOE effects. Now, granted, a lot of AOE effects are going to instantly kill your summons if you don't give them 15 or 20 more temporary hit points. But if you're fairly certain that your summons can at least survive one of those, you can you can maintain their uh, life, you can maintain them with the Unicorn Spirit and Guardian Spirit, like the Guardian Spirit alone at times, right? You can maintain them uh, standing instead of dying for a long, long, long time. Uh, this is very, very potent. It's It's like the amount of synergy with all of these like lower and higher level features is just crazy. This is legitimately, I would say, the most powerful druid of all. I, I think there's no other official, at least. Like, I'm not 
counting uh, unearthed arcana and third party druids i'm talking about official druids I, th I don't think there's anything more powerful in terms of raw numbers raw stats raw mechanics than this this druid it's just crazy um faithful summons it's a fairly high level feature um i don't think you will be Accounting like on, on four CR2 creatures uh, is going to matter at level 14, but just in case you do get dropped to zero or incapacitated against your will, I think getting incapacitated against your will is gonna happen much, much more often than getting dropped to zero hit points. Well, every time it, that happens means that you will inevitably lose concentration on whatever spell you're concentrating on. Most likely you will be concentrating on conjure animals. Um, in that case, well, all of those animals are gone, but guess what? Four additional CR2 or lower creatures appear and they keep the swarm going. This is a once per day feature. Uh, it's a fairly high level feature and at this point like four CR2 creatures are not gonna matter, but it's still four additional creatures on your side, ready to protect you, to aid your allies, to keep fighting whatever you're fighting, and sometimes maybe even prevent you from dying, because who knows, the monster might just switch from pummeling your dying body to pummeling the bears or whatever uh, got summoned. Uh, oh yeah, you can actually choose, I think, if you are... Uh, it summons four beasts of your choice. So yeah, you can choose whatever CR2 creature uh, or two of two or lower. Uh, there's like bears, I think, like octopuses, whatever. So yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of very good creatures, beasts that you can summon with this. And there's also some kind of minor cheese potential because... I mean, if you think about it, you can sort of go in face first, get dropped to zero hit points, trigger this feature. And then there's like a cleric who will heal you for, I don't know... 50 70 hit points with high levels uh, healing spell basically bringing you back from uh, to like uh, more than half of your hit points and uh, then on top because this spell doesn't require concentration uh, requiring no concentration right so now you have four cr2 creatures and then you cast conjure animals and then you have like eight or 16 or i don't know maybe even more cr one quarter creatures it's <laughs> yeah you, it's crazy you can you can like you you can really cause your dm a lot of headache um but yeah i mean uh, always like the dm is always the all powerful creature in the game like he can always kill you or your characters or whatever he can drop, drop like whatever he wants on you so the be civil about it don't laugh in your dm's face because the encounters are made to be sort of like balanced in most cases or at least to give you at least somewhat of a fighting chance um, or at least a chance to escape before getting pummeled into into death um, so yeah you being able to to cancel a lot of a lot of that danger maybe it may be even like the majority of that danger or maybe even all of it um, they, that can often cause a frustration to the DM so yeah I mean uh, Always, always keep good faith and, and good relations with your DM. Uh, better, like, better than any other player at the table. Um, timeless body at level 18, uh, you kind of age less slowly. And uh, it's kind of cool because you're already a fairly long-lived creature. You live up to 450 years. So now your body ages one year. So technically that's like... Uh, 4,500? That's crazy. That I didn't even think about this up until this point. That's just... You can live 4.5 thousand years. That's... Wow. Okay. Well. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, beast spells. Level 18. You can cast as many of your druid spells in your beast shape as you like. You ignore uh, the verbal and somatic components, but still, if the spells require material components, you kind of can't cast them in your wild sh while, while you're wild shaped. Uh, conjure animals and conjure uh, fey work because they don't require uh, material components, but conjure woodland beings do require material material components. More on this, more on all of these spells, which are getting continuously mentioned uh, very, very soon. Finally, at level 20, Arch Druid, uh, it's like one of the best, if not the best, capstone level 20 features. 
just downright crazy. You can be a beast for an unlimited amount of time, like an unlimited amount of uh, time. So whenever you get dropped out of your beast shape, you turn back into your beast shape and basically you have near infinite amount of hit points. The only way to legitimately drop you down to zero is either to deal you like, I don't know, three... 250 300 of, of damage before like in the in between of your turns or just like i don't know stun you or do some kind of other thing but even then like it's it's not very easy to do it against uh, druids because they have proficiency in mental saving throws so yeah it's very very hard uh now let's switch on to the spells uh, in terms of cantrips guidance is obviously the first and foremost choice it's just a flat out plus one d4 to, to all ability checks of to one ability check of your choice in the next minute. This comes up uh, out of combat all the time. Whenever you are uh, investigating, uh, dropping perception checks, any any type of skill checks, ability checks, this comes up very often. And also, don't forget, um, this spell magic calls for uh, spell casting ability checks. So if you're not fighting, if you're not concentrating on one of those spells. Uh, that we discussed many times and we are gonna go into more details very soon. This spell is actually gonna help this spell stuff uh, on average more often than not. Mold Earth, I would say um, this is probably the best utility spell. Uh, one of the best, if not the best utility spells because creativity is the limit of this spell. You can make barriers, you can make dig holes, make bridges if you have enough time. Uh, you can, like, the amount, just the fact that this is a cantrip, meaning that you can cast it unlimited amount of times per day, I mean, it requires an action, so I guess you are limited by the time, but you can cast it so many times in just the span of one hour, um, yeah, there's, like, a lot of things you can do with this, it's crazy, um, uh, Thorn Whip is your sort of like attack cantrip um, due to the fact that you're gonna be relying on conjure animals, beasts, uh, fey, whatever uh, you're not gonna, you yourself are not gonna be the one dealing damage but still it, it pays to have at least one cantrip that deals some damage because spell slots are a limited resource so they eventually inevitably run away especially if your DM throws a bunch of stuff at you and you're only left with cantrips, and it's good to have at least one, right? In your particular case, um, this is a, uh, just the fact that uh, it has some kind of like a battlefield control feature, being able to pull the creature you hit 10, time, 10 feet closer to you, means that oftentimes you're gonna be able to get allies out of danger, you will be able to smack enemies leaving your reach, because Vor cast their feet, um, enables you to uh, cast spells on opportunity attacks and what are a spell to cast other than a cantrip because it costs you nothing, costs you no spell slot and it deals decent damage, not much damage but it's a melee attack so it synergizes with the feat because the feat calls, I mean it doesn't even, doesn't even matter, you can just cast spell but still, I mean casting cantrips is better than wasting spell slots so yeah that's about it. Finally, Druidcraft, I think, uh, another very imp very good uh, uh, utility spell, uh, utility cantrip, uh, you, you can predict weather patterns, uh, yeah, you can sort of like become a botanist with this, sort of, I mean, yeah, it's kind of like a wordplay here, a little bit of a humor, um, you can do stuff with this, another one that I would mention if you kind of like, if you think, if you think, yeah, I'm tired of Druidcraft, I want to try something else, Mending is very good, um, because obviously you can fix broken stuff with it. Um, I don't think anything like Shillelagh is one of those spells that sort of like you would say is an auto take with all every druid. But in in this particular case, I mean, in in, in all seriousness, Thorn Whip is better because uh, why would you you why would you hit stuff with your just why would you just deal like one d eight plus whatever damage if you can deal a little bit less damage but eventually 4d6 because thorn whip is uh, like it, it has your standard uh, cantrip uh, progression uh, every time you hit uh, a lowest level of the next tier uh, you get one additional damage die so yeah you will eventually deal 3d6 4d6 damage so even more damage than shillelagh on average 
Um, but uh, on top of that, you will have the uh, the battlefield, like the minor battlefield control with the ability to pull the creature 10 feet closer to. I think, like, in this particular case, for this build, yeah, you can take Shalele, but I think it's just a waste because you will be casting Thorn Whip anyway. It has, like, superior reach. It has, like, 30 feet reach. Uh, it's a melee spell attack, so it counts for, like, melee attacks. I it's it's I think it's better. There's no need to take Shalele, but if you like Shalele, I mean take it. It's it's not really, it's not ultimately gonna matter too much. But in terms of like optimizing this build as much as possible, my opinion is that you don't need to take it. It's just a waste. Take the take the utility cantrips, take the non-combat cantrips, and uh, keep Thorn Whip as your only combat cantrip because in my opinion that's the only one that you need. A first level spells absorb elements uh, not gonna be very useful to you on lower levels in most cases, but whenever you get uh, damaged by the elemental type of damage, which is fire, cold, thunder, lightning, acid, whatever, um, this spell is go this spell is gonna come in effect because uh, it will half the damage that you take, and on your next melee attack you will be able to deal some of that damage back. And we have a Thorn Whip cantrip with a 30 feet reach. You will be able to deal some of that absorbed damage back to the attacker, right? So this is actually a very, very cool synergy between these two spells. And in terms of the main thing that this does for you is pretty much prevents you from losing concentration in a lot of cases. Because oftentimes you get damage for like 50, 60, 70 damage ele of elemental type. Like, it's not, it's not, it's not very rare to get damaged by like some type of dragon or something for that amount of damage. And then you half that damage. And uh, the way it works is, for example, if you if you take 70 damage, you half it to 35, and then your DC. For uh, the maintaining, uh, for maintaining the concentration on the co uh, maintaining concentration on the concentration spell, meaning that you have to roll the Constitution saving throw is half of that damage. So you have the 70 damage with the absorb elements, that's 35, and then you half that to uh, calculate your DC. So that's uh, I'm a math uh, stupido, so it's going to be yeah, it's going to be 17 because it, it rounds down. A DC of 17 is much better than a DC of 35, trust me. So, uh, yeah, in a lot of cases this is going to at least give you a chance to maintain concentration on a spell uh, uh, instead of just flat out being unable to maintain concentration whatsoever. A uh, healing word, uh, a very, very good, uh, it's probably, like, a healing word is one of those problematic spells, like, why, why a lot of tables, why a lot of DMs, um, uh, sort of push custom rules, whenever you get drop to zero hit points, you have to roll some kind of constitution save, uh, get a level of exhaustion and stuff like that, because, first and foremost, it's a bonus action, so you can still do your action and cast this spell, it's got a range of 60 feet and it provides healing. So whenever the creature gets dropped to zero hit points, you just bring it back up to whatever, right? 1d4 plus your spellcasting ability. That can be 3, 5, 7, who knows. It's not a lot of healing, but it's a first level spell that prevents the creature from dying. It prevents the creature from even the possibility of dying because that creature no longer has to roll death saving throws. Um, and also... Just in case the cleric and the paladin in your party go down and you're the only one left standing, it's better that you have at least this healing spell if you don't have any other healing spell uh, prepared for that day. Detect magic, one of those catch-all uh, level 1 um, utility spells. A very, very good spell, which I'm not sure... It is, isn't it not on the... Huh, weird. I think it's. Uh, it should be on a druid spell list. Uh, let me check this. Hmm. Spells. <clears throat> That's weird. It should be, right? Uh, Druid? If it's not, well, then it's my mistake and I will uh, fix it in the middle of the video because that's what we do, right? Um, let me see. So, first little spells. Detect magic. 
it is uh, it is it is there yeah it's probably some kind of mistake there but uh, anyway yeah detect magic uh, you can ritually cast this because it's got a ritual tag uh, so you don't even have to waste the spell slot it's uh, it's sort of like a catch-all solution for magical traps and other like invisible hidden magic phenomena uh, a very low level spell that that's oftentimes that can prevent uh, unnecessary damage harm or just danger from uh, happening to, your, to you or party members fairy fire this is sort of like one of those low level spells that is gonna be very very good at low levels right but as you keep leveling up and finally when you hit level five i don't think you will ever be casting this spell other than like a very very fringe type of scenario extreme type of scenario where you are completely out of your second and third level spell slots and the only spell slots you have are your first level spell slots and in that case you still need some kind of if you can help your allies at least in some way it's better to give them advantage so yeah every time the creature fails the deck saving throw it's illuminated uh it also works as sort of like a debuff against invisible creatures so yeah technically it can be used even on higher levels against invisible creatures because it illuminates them like illuminates it just illuminates around the creatures that fail um sort of like makes an outline but i don't think you will be using this a lot at least in my experience playing this particular like this exact character from level three to six online i don't think i ever cast this spell after i hit level five so yeah goodberry is uh another utility spell that prevents hunger right basically at level 1 uh, druid just you don't need anything other than good berry it, pr it produces 10 good berries all of your party members are instantly uh, satiated they they're no longer hungry so yeah that's a very very good spell at level 2 we have a uh, spike growth which is a spell again you will be using this from level th uh, level 3 to s like at level 3 and 4 of your druid you don't you still don't have access to your summoning spells uh, so yeah, this spell is gonna be good because uh, it sort of has a synergy with uh, with the Thorn Whip because Thorn Whip enables you to pull the creature 10 feet closer. So if you put the spike growth in the area where the creature is and you pull that creature 10 feet closer to you, it takes 44 damage. So yeah, it's a difficult terrain, um, the, so pre it prevents the creature from moving uh yeah it's very very good at the level that you get it but later on i don't think you will actually ever cast this spell uh after you get uh level three uh, spells pass without trace uh another one of those uh very very good utility spells even though you yourself do not have proficiency in stealth it's still very good to have this spell because it's just a flat out plus 10 bonus to stealth checks uh, and you can't be tracked except by magical means, meaning that you leave no traces of your presence. Yeah, it's very good for sneaking around and getting undetected. You don't really want to fight enemies all the time. Sometimes you just want to get around their defenses and kill the general in the middle of the, uh, like, in the middle of the war camp, right? A uh, healing spirit, uh, I don't like it. Um, it's one of those spells if you, if you've been playing the game for any amount of time, if you've actually just heard around this spell, you know that there's a lot of controversy around this spell. I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but basically, if the DM allows it in its raw form, this spell can be very, 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 very good in those cases where um, you are in danger and you don't have one hour to short rest. You have just one minute to try to heal up, and this is all you need to heal up because it's basically 10d6. Of healing to everybody in the party because everybody makes a line and ju they just pass the spirit and everybody every time they do they get healed by 1d6 hit points so yeah it's basically one minute that means 10 rounds that means 10d6 to everybody it's a lot of healing it's 35 healing on average to everybody <sighs> at level 3 and 4 when you get this spell it's just even later on like you have a you have to be very high level to uh, to even to even require this spell to be upcast you can just cast this spell at the lowest level that it is and it's still gonna be a lot of healing but that said i don't think you need this i've never actually been in a situation me myself as a player where this spell would matter uh, i it's just 
it's like it's a very very extreme fringe case scenario but it in, in case you don't know about this it's better that you at least know about it and uh, maybe if you know in advance that you're gonna be in some kind of danger where this spell might be useful meaning that you kind of predict uh, assume that you won't be able to short rest yeah it's very very good finally Conjure animals. I mentioned this spell for probably like 17 times so far in this video. Um, this spell is... Uh, you get it at level 5 because it's a level 3 spell. Um, it's so broke. I'm not gonna say broken, but it's definitely overpowered in your own hands. As explained previously in the video, you can give everybody, including your summons, 5 plus your druid level. So the moment you hit level 5... All of your summons are can have 5 plus 5 because you're 5th level druid. So 10 additional temporary hit points. So your Velociraptors, instead of having just 10, they have 20. Your uh, Giant Owls, instead of having 19 hit points, they have 29, I believe. It's, it's crazy. Like, the amount of hit points you can have... Uh, uh, you like this particular type of druid is crazy your summons are gonna be able to survive through a lot of aoe effects that inflict some kind of like damage because in a lot of cases conjure animals can be easily countered with like a fireball but in your particular case just for the fact that you give it additional hit points and then just one more level level six of your druid all of your summons have additional two hit points per hit die they have and a lot of those uh, quarter challenging beasts have at least two hit die so that's four additional hit points it's just crazy um talk to your dm this spell is actually very okay so the official stance of the uh, designers of the game says that i'm not gonna read the feature but basically it's somewhere in there uh, spell casting, blah blah blah. Yeah, it's basically explained here. It's like a, a very old post from 2015. Uh, the official stance of the designers is that you choose the challenge rating of the beasts, but the DM chooses which beasts appear on the field. Sure, the spell itself doesn't actually say that you choose the beast, the only choice you have is the challenge rating. Uh, I'd say that talk to your DM, at least come to an agreement that if you choose 8 beasts of challenge rating a quarter or lower, at least ask your DM not to give you challenge rating 0 monsters, because that's just dick move. And if you have a DM who is gonna persist on giving you, uh, on, on like forcing you to cast a level 3 spell and then giving you bullshit useless monsters, um... First and foremost, I wouldn't even play the game under such a DM because that's just asshole behavior. I would just leave the table and never come again. But uh, second of all, uh, if uh, if he's gonna ask, if, if he's gonna persist in doing dick moves like that, just don't play this class because, I mean, it's it's just not gonna be it's not gonna be enjoyable at all. Like, and it's just like the DM is a prick, and I'm sorry that you uh, have to play under such a I don't know. Uh, frustrated person who who thinks that by doing that they have some kind of power over i don't know it's i'm not gonna go into psychology this video is already over hour long let's just not waste time uh it's a topic for another video but yeah basically uh talk to your dm always talk to your dm about this stuff um dms do hold a lot of control over fifth edition so it's always good to, to be at least on good terms with the dms even though sometimes you might not even agree with their opinions, their stances, their way of running the game. Um, another spell that I would say is very good, it's sort of like mandatory if the DM allows you to take uh, the background, which we discussed at the, uh, earlier in the video. The Azorius uh, Functionary, one of the Ravnica uh, backgrounds. Uh, yeah, pick the counter spell. Like uh, You definitely at some point will need this spell. You or somebody in your party having counter spell is going to allow you to cast conjure animals or any other spell uninterrupted, at least in theory, right? If a DM decides to drop 10 spellcasters, 
all of them having counter spells on their list, I, I, I don't think there's anything you will be able to do. But, again, having this spell is better than not having, so yeah, if you, if you are an Azorius functionary, definitely, definitely have this spell prepared. Uh, this spell magic, it is on the druid list, so you don't, you don't have to worry at least about this one. Um... I would say uh, definitely use the Guidance Cantrip again uh, if you are not concentrating on any of your other spells, namely Conjure Animals. Uh, this is this spell is gonna come up uh, outside of the combat. It's probably gonna come up inside inside the combat as well if there's an enemy with some kind of buff on him or her or it. You will try it. You you can definitely negate stop the buff from running uh, any longer with this spell magic. Yeah, Plant Growth. Um, okay, so you don't need this, but uh, just for the fact that there's a limited amount of spells that you can prepare, but at least be aware that this spell exists in the game. It's very powerful, it can be used out of, outside of the combat because it just, it, 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 it makes miracles happen, right? It's just, <laughs> if you cast this spell for 8 hours, the land in a half mile radius becomes enriched for 1 year, and... The plants yield twice the normal amount. So if you think about it, all you need in 5th uh, edition Dungeons and Dragons is one 5th level druid who is gonna cast this on your fields and farming areas all around uh, your farms and then you will get double the amount of uh, wheat or whatever type of corn or whatever type of food you are farming on the land. It's crazy, yeah. Uh, I don't think like... Okay, okay, I'm not gonna get too much into it, but if you think about it, if there's magic in the world, there's no possibility for industrial revolution to happen. Let's just let's just keep it at that. Yeah, it's a topic to think about. Maybe it's a topic for another video. Yeah, I'm getting ideas here, but I'm talking too much. Let's keep moving forward. Um, that said, yeah, no, you don't need it, but it's very very good. And even in combat, um, uh, you, I mean, you just a creature moving through the area. It's not even difficult terrain. Uh, it's like better than difficult terrain. A creature moving through the area must spend four feet of movement to move just one feet of movement. So difficult terrain basically calls for two feet of movement per one feet of movement, but this thing calls for double that. So yeah, this can stop a lot of creatures in their track. Like a lot of creatures are gonna be effectively immobilized by this spell. It's just, yeah, it's very powerful. Uh, level 4, we have Conjure Woodland Beings. It's a similar spell to Conjure Animals. It's like uh, almost ex almost, like, almost word for word exactly written. It's just like a different uh, type of uh, beasts, a different type of creatures that you summon. Um, again, if your DM allows you... <clears throat> if your DM allows you to pick the beasts, uh, to pick the fey uh, that you can do, uh, I, I would I would at least uh, warn the DM of the possibility of conjuring eight pixies, and then all of those pixies they have polymorph. So now you have eight creatures who have like innate invisibility, who can cast polymorph, and then they polymorph all of the party into giant apes and tear. They, like it, it's one of those broken combos it's like an infamous combo once you get like a level 7 level 8 uh, druid uh, yeah I mean most DMs who keep up with the game know about this combo so most DMs put at least some kind of stop to this either they they just remove polymorph from pixies or they even don't allow pixies or I don't know they just there's ways to stop this first and foremost the DM can just say that you don't get to choose the type of fake creatures uh, that appear on the battlefield but there's a big but with this spell there aren't actually a lot of challenge rating uh, quarter beasts uh, fake there's only three types there's a sprite there's a pixie and there's a blink dog so if you come to a agreement with your DM that if you choose a challenge rating of one quarter or lower, that the DM is not gonna pull off a dick move and just like put, I don't know, eight boggles on the field, which are sort of good on their own as well. They're not bad, they're just, eh, whatever. Um, I would say that like, even in that case, you have like 33% chance of 
getting pixies on the board and that's still good um so yeah there, like this spell even if it's just full-on random it, it can be very very powerful finally if the dm decides to just like give you eight blink dogs or eight sprites i mean you're not going to be able to pull off this combo but definitely talk to the dm again um uh, again i told you earlier in the video a lot of this build is going to depend on, upon the dm so keep that social contract running bring over beers pretzels and uh food uh, keep your dm happy so uh th so that he can give you all of this awesome stuff um giant insect uh if conjure woodland beings and conjure animals doesn't work if you cannot if you don't have any control over what type of beasts appear on the battlefield with giant insect you have no troubles it's not even a conjuration type of spell it's a transmutation because you take living centipedes spiders wasps scorpions uh, and you turn them into giant versions of those beasts so yeah you can turn 10 giant centipedes i don't know uh how many uh just like five score one scorpion three giant wasps uh, five spiders it's written somewhere in there yeah uh, three spiders five wasps one scorpion um centipedes they on their on themselves they have like four hit points but if you put the bear spirit totem they can have like plus 15 or something depending on your druid level and then on top of that they have like plus two because they have a one hit die three more level six feature um they're not bad like they they deal additional poison damage um and uh if, if they drop drop a creature to zero hit points they don't kill it so yeah this creature has actually very decent utility in combat it's just it's not like trash in your in your particular case because you can give it a lot of hit points and it deals a fair amount of uh, damage um so yeah it's very very decent although uh, the cre the dc for the poison damage is not very high so oftentimes you will you won't deal uh, much damage but still i mean 10 giant centipedes is better than zero than like a bunch of random creatures or some type of beast that uh, the dm gives you it's kind of like trash uh, you don't really need it want it you don't have much use for it um so yeah that's that's the spell uh, that i would uh recommend and finally we have polymorph now in all, in all other cases i would make polymorph i would say that polymorph is like i would put it in red meaning that i would heavily heavily recommend it but i mean at the level that you get it you get this spell at level seven um i'm not sure you're gonna be using this spell all too often based on the fact that you have all of these other spells i mean you're gonna be concentrating on conjure animals uh inside of the combat like 90 or even 90 percent of the time or even more so yeah i would say polymorph is definitely it's it's definitely a must have but i would say it's more like a high level a high level spell because um it's it's just the fact that you, it's a fourth level spell means that at higher levels where you will have a lot of spell slots you will be able to cast this spell willy-nilly without without worrying about burning through your spell slots and the effect of the spell is very powerful it will force a creature who fails a saving throw uh to burn one of their legendary resistances so once you're fighting one of those legendary creatures the bosses whatever and they they have those legendary resistances meaning that uh, they can turn a fail saving throw into a success um this spell can be used uh, to burn through those more easier like or definitely easier right so yeah finally we have divination divination is uh, another spell from the azorius functionary background again if you, if the dm doesn't allow these backgrounds you can't take this spell because it's to my belief yeah it's only a cleric spell but if you can get it definitely get it because uh, this spell will allow you uh, given that you ask good questions uh it will allow you to cr to obtain a lot of critical info uh very very valuable info on uh, stuff that goes on in the campaign now uh, moving on to level five spells we have awaken uh, i would say uh for the uh casting of the spell it's it's very expensive it's like it requires 1000 gold pieces but uh if you get get across a t-rex i don't know if you if, if you can find a t-rex anywhere in the world like it, it, it's it's 
or even even a giant ape, any type of like high challenge rating beast, um, you will be able to 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 awaken the beast with this spell, and that means the beast or plant which you cast this spell on. Uh, is charmed by you for the next 30 days. Charmed basically means that it's sort of like friendly to you, uh, they can't attack you, uh, you have advantage on, on ability checks to interact socially with the creature. Now, that means you're not fully in control of the creature, uh, but the creature is definitely way, way more prone to uh, listen to you. Uh, you can procure some kind of favor, um, so yeah, definitely, it's like, if, if, if you can get across, like, a herd of T-Rexes and have a lot of gold to waste, you can build, like, an army of T-Rexes and giant apes or whatever. I, I, maybe giant apes have, uh, don't have, uh, the, uh, they have, I think they have higher intelligence, but, uh, yeah, their intellect is seven, but, I mean, T-Rex has less than, uh, three or, uh, their, their intellect is two. So it's a big dumb beast, and uh, this spell basically, the target must have either no intelligence score or intelligence of three or less. So yeah, like again, a bunch of T-Rex is uh, is a very very real possibility with this spell alone. Um, Conjure elemental, even though the elementals don't get the benefits from your, uh, they can get a benefit from your uh, bear totem or any other spirit aura, but they don't get the benefits of your level 6 feature. Um, there are more than enough high CR, high challenge rating uh, elementals. Uh, this spell can cast a higher challenge rating elementals if you use a higher level slot. Uh, that are going to be very useful, namely Invisible Stalker. It's one of those very, very nasty uh, elementals that's very hard to deal with because it's just invisible. <laughs> it's in the name of the elemental. And it makes two slam attacks and basically due to the fact that the stalk stalker is, is invisible, all of those slam attacks, they are uh, they are made with advantage. So yeah, you can inflict a lot of damage with this, a lot of crits and stuff like that. I would say that... Um, uh, yeah, they're they're powerful on their own and if you need one powerful creature instead of like eight or four Like less powerful like weaker ones. This is like you would definitely want to have this spell prepared uh, Planner binding is one of those other I would say I'm not gonna say controversial spells But the spells which is gonna rely on your DM making a ruling by raw this spell uh, cannot be used to bind any of the creatures that you summon with your spells just for the fact that it takes one hour of casting time. That means the moment you start casting this spell you're gonna break your concentration or co on Conjure Elemental or even Conjure Fey or whatever spell that you uh, use to conjure to summon one of those uh, high challenge rating creatures. But um, if you can manage to get some of your other party members to maybe uh, put the creature in a, ma in a magic circle or maybe the party member summon some kind of demon or, I don't know, fey or whatever, um, you can bind them with this spell if the DM agrees with the type of this design intent behind this spell. Now, design intent behind this spell says that even though the spell lasts like there's a casting time of one hour. You can definitely, uh, at least by Jeremy Crawford's account, um, he would allow for planar binding to trigger if the planar binding is getting casted immediately after the monster appears. So, in this particular case, the example exa is, is, is exactly Conjure Elemental. And if we go back to the spells over here, you will see that Conjure Elemental there's a duration of one hour, but that means if you cast a spell and then start casting planar binding, first and foremost the concentration is gonna drop, so you will have a wild uncontrolled elemental at your hands, but let's just say you can contain it in a magic circle or some kind of other, you can subdue it in some way, either through a spell or magic item. Uh, by raw, you will be late six seconds, because you spent an action, you spent a minute, but upon finishing the casting of the spell, you need to wait additional round to be able to start casting planar binding, and unfortunately, that's going to be 
uh, six seconds uh, after the elemental just disappears. Um, by raw, that's how it works, but it seems that even Jeremy Crawford says that the... I mean, the intention of the planar binding is for you to be able to bind those conjured elementals, conjured fey, or even summoned demons, even though I wouldn't really... I would advise, advise against summoning demons, but yeah, definitely. Um, that's what you can do. Uh, talk to your DM, send him this link if you need, uh, let him know, discuss the, discuss the issue... Uh, let him know what you want to do, let him know your intentions, it's always better to do it that way instead of just, aha, I'm gonna do this, and then the DM is like, but, yeah, yeah, don't do it, uh, talk to your DM. Great Restoration, uh, okay, so, I don't think you need this spell per se, you don't really need it prepared, again, but, I mean, it counters so many conditions, problems, issues, challenges that you will be faced with as either yourself or one of your party members that it's uh, for the fact that it only costs 100 gold uh, you can deal with a lot of these problems and I think it's very good to have it prepared just in case some some of these things happen and even if you don't have it prepared uh, be aware that you have this spell on your list um, every time your uh, party member gets affected by one of these problematic conditions issues problems uh, prepare this spell the next day and uh, fix your party member. Scrying, I mean, in all other cases, I would say this is a red spell. It's probably even red, like, it's very important spell, because you, if you know where and when to look, you can see a lot of very critical information. You can see a lot of stuff which is uh, gonna reveal some uh, information that otherwise you wouldn't be able to know. Reincarnate, uh, the spell is very actually funny on its own because in 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 like the chances of uh, reviving the creature and that creature coming back as what it was before, I don't think there's a lot of chance of that happening. But in case in case that that doesn't happen, I mean at least the creature is no longer dead. A dead uh, a, a live humanoid, even though it's another race. Is still better than uh, than a dead human, right? <clears throat> now I'm kind of having trouble finding the spell. There it is. Okay, so basically that's the spell. This is a list of races. This is an, an old list of races. This spell is uh, is being released like a ba uh, in, 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 with basic rules, uh, with like additional um, expansions of the game. Th there are more races, so I would advise. For your DM to, if especially the DM has some kind of like, if the DM allows for all of these additional races to be used in the game, to come up with some kind of like a custom list uh, that will include all of these Loxodons and Minotaurs and uh, all different sorts of Tieflings and uh, who knows, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, the spell does cost, but it's costly, but I mean, it brings the dead humanoid back to life, so, <laughs> I mean, it has to cost something, right? Uh, finally, we have Mass Cure Wounds. If you are the only healer in the party, or in case you know that you have to pull off some kind of major heals, heal everybody in the party because everybody is low, um, this is the spell that will get the job done. It's not, it's not gonna be a lot of healing, but... 3d8 plus 3, 4, or 5, depending on your ability modifier. I think I still think it's better than nothing. So yeah, that's about it. Conjure phase, one of the last, like, conjuration summoning spells that's gonna be uh, important to you. Uh, it's, I mean, it's fey, first and foremost, so it will, uh, it will benefit from all of your features that uh, pertain to fey and beasts. But uh, it's somewhat weak on its own, because... Uh, if the DM lets you use planar binding to it, uh, with it, it becomes a force multiplier. But if you think about it, planar binding only comes in play if you can upcast it. Uh, planar binding uh, on the fifth level only lasts 24 hours, and it costs 1k gold. So you really need like sixth or even seventh level spell slot for all of these uh, planary binded uh, creatures, elementals, fey, uh, for for them to be able to be with you. For like extended periods of time. That said, again, if you need um, a powerful creature instead of uh, a weak one, 
uh, elemental is good, but once you hit level 6, uh, you can uh, rely on uh, the creatures that are actually going to benefit fully from all of your uh, class features. So, um, namely the uh, Mighty Summoner and Guardian Spirit. So, uh, yeah, basically, uh, you can summon hags, you can summon even T-Rexes, because the face Spirit can take a form of a beast. Uh, of a challenge rating 6 or lower. So yeah, you can definitely summon a T-Rex on the battlefield. Uh, if you can upcast this le this spell as an 8 level uh, spell, right? If you can spend this 8 level spell slot, that's gonna depend on your character level. But yeah, that's about it. Um, that is that is it for the Conjure Fae. Uh, Hero's Feast, I would say... Um, if you know that you are going to fight the big bad evil guy, if you know that the fight is gonna be hard, deadly, it's gonna be bloody. Um, and once you amass a gang of all of these planar binded fey which you conjured, like the elementals, the awakened T-Rexes, who knows, right? You just manage to get yourself a nice little assortment, uh, a gang of fey and beast creatures who listen to you for the time being. Hero's Feast comes into play because up to 12 creatures can partake in the feast. It says creatures, so they don't have to be humanoids. Um, and uh, yeah, you bring up these great feasts. The casting time is not even that long. The duration is kind of instantaneous, but obviously the feast takes one hour. You bring up all of these food and stuff. Uh, all of the creatures are cured, cured of disease and poison. They are immune to poison. Uh, and uh, being frightened, and they make all of their wisdom saving throws with advantage. Wisdom saving throws is one of the most uh, frequent type of mental saving throw in the game. Low level or, or high level, especially high level when a lot of monsters will attack wisdom. So yeah, and your hit points maximum is gonna increase by a little bit. Uh, gains the same amount of hit points, and these benefits last for 24 hours. It's a costly spell. But it's a spell that you're gonna definitely, I mean, you will definitely cast it if you know what you're gonna get yourself, simply, right? So, that's about it. Uh, transport via plants is basically teleport, but instead of casting teleportation circle or some kind of like that stuff, uh, um, yeah, uh, transport via plants is basically gonna be every, every sufficiently large, uh, where is this spell? Um, yeah, there it is. Okay, so, basically every, uh, inanimate plant of large or larger dimensions, uh, is gonna be sort of like a portal which you can use to go, uh, back and forth from and into. Uh, Druid Grow is a very, I mean, it's a very cool thematic spell. <clears throat> Uh, that's actually really useful when ro long resting in hostile territory. Um, yeah, it was somewhere down below. So yeah, basically all of these defenses are really, really solid. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, there's like, a, you can you can evoke a bunch of magical defenses. And Dispel Magic, uh, when you cast Dispel, blah, blah, blah. Uh, dispel Magic cast in the area only removes one of these effects. And there's a lot of these effects. So, uh, if once somebody starts casting Dispel Magic, you will probably get uh, woken up by the chantings and uh, uh, verbal components of the spell. Uh, Dispel Magic definitely has verbal components, right? Um, I might be wrong. Let me check. Yeah, it has verbal components. It should have verbal components, definitely. Yeah, who am I kidding? So, yeah, definitely it's a very, very useful spell. I think you should definitely have it prepared. Um... Especially in if your party finds your uh, finds themselves, uh, you and your party find yourself uh, in uh, hostile territory very very often. A regenerate level seven spell, <clears throat> uh, just in case you lose an arm or a leg, it's going to be useful. Doesn't happen very often, but uh, yeah, uh, if that even doesn't happen, it heals a little bit. Um, you can uh, regain the hit point uh, each each of your turn. So it lasts for one hour and uh, one hit point every turn, so that's 10 hit points per minute. That's 60 hit points per hour. It's decent. It's decent amount of healing. It takes it takes like an hour just in case you're like at your at your third short rest and one of the party members is like completely beat up. He has no hit points, no hit die. Um, casting this spell on him is gonna be definitely gonna bring him up from uh, almost certain death. Um, 
So yeah, that's that plane shift. Basically, when you get this spell, the campaign stops being a campaign of the DM's choice. It becomes the plane uh, hopping campaign. Uh, if you have like a new DM, an uh, inexperienced DM who is going to bring you up to at least level, this is like a 7th level spell, so it's going to be a 13th level character, tell him of the existence of this spell, because it's very, very problematic once this spell goes off unchecked, right? Because you can just hop in any plane that you want, and the, the DM is not going to be ready for that. If he or she doesn't have the materials prepared for all of these... Elemental planes of fire, water, uh, the pandemonium, who knows, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, so yeah, uh, if, the, if the DM allows this spell, have it prepared. Because it's very interesting to be able to, to jump to all of these planes. But, you know, if the DM doesn't even know about the existence of this spell, which is definitely possible if the DM is new, at least tell him. So uh, yeah, be, be nice and cordial to your DM. Mirage Arcane, uh, I would say, uh, illusions overall, in general, depend a lot on DMs, period. This is not just uh, the problem of this build, even though this build relies a lot on DMs making rulings, right? Because all of these spells uh, will require you talking to your DM to see what he or she uh, thinks about those spells. But in terms of Mirage Arcane or any other... Uh, high level illusions or any other illusions uh, whatsoever they they largely depend on dm's interpretations and rulings because there's no hard uh, mechanics with illusion spells you can do pretty much anything with them your creativity is the limit to these spells but also the limit to the spells uh, effectiveness is just dm's deciding well that illusion is not very effective the monster is not fooled even though you came up with some ridiculously creative, unique idea. Yeah, I mean, it's up to DM, but if the DM allows for illusions to be effective, Mirage Arcane is very powerful. Level 8 spells, we have animal shapes. Uh, why did I skip this? Why am I uh, going back now, wasting even more time? Sorry for that, the video is way too long. Sorry, <laughs> that's just me. Me and my videos. Animal shapes, um, your magic turns others into beasts. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I mean... If you're gonna be playing this character for for any amount of time, uh, the party members with all, with all of their own uh, uh, tricks and uh, spells and whatnot are gonna probably gonna be jealous of you because you're just spamming the battlefield with all of all of these like uh, singular high challenge rating monsters fighting at your side, or maybe even like spamming the battlefield with. Uh, 32 challenge rating quarter monsters that have like 45 50 hit points each or some ridiculous stuff like that um so yeah uh once once they kind of start being uh, yeah here we go he's casting conjure animals and that maybe it's time for a little bit of a change so at this point your party members you can turn them into one of those beasts now challenge rating four or lower but that's high enough there's decent amount of uh, high CR monsters, high CR beasts that you can turn your party members in. Um, if they are willing, definitely do that. It's not the most powerful spell, but I think just for the fact that you have all of these other ones uh, that you can rely on if this spell fails, it's you can afford to waste an 8-level spell on this one. Control, weather, I mean... 8 level spells should be powerful, this is a powerful spell, you can pretty much manipulate weather however you want, there's limits, uh, there's ways, like there's the, the way you control it is sort of like progressive, it relies on this table, uh, goes like uh, it scales, um, but yeah, I mean, you can definitely change weather up to your whims, uh, it lasts for 8 hours, so yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Um, it's crazy how much, uh, how much like influence you can have as a high level character. It's just like downright boggling. Um, Feeble mind, uh, very very good single target spell. If the creature, monster, enemy that you target with this spell fails the saving throw, uh, you pretty much render it almost useless. He can, he, she it can still fight, protect the allies, but it's like its intelligence and charisma becomes one. It's a it, be, it becomes, like, it's even more stupid than a T-Rex, who is already a big, dumb, lumbering beast, who just 
bites stuff and hits stuff with a tail, right? It's just like basic primal savage beast. Um, yeah, very, very, very powerful, although a little bit situational. And maybe, I mean, it's an 8 level spell, you only have one chance of making this work if the monster succeeds on the saving throw. You just wasted an 8 level slot, which could be used to maybe animal shapes or even conjure animals, conjure fey, making one like making just like one additional high CR creature on the battlefield. Um, I would say it can be definitely a showstopper. I've actually seen it recently used against me, one of my party members. In my, I'm a, in my, in the campaign that I'm DMing, and also in that same the same campaign that I'm gonna be DMing online starting uh, very soon next month um he used the feeble mind he used it effectively the monster failed the saving throw it was a total showstopper because the monster was actually a spellcaster and uh yeah no longer no high level spells being cast against the party anymore and the encounter from very hard turned into a child's play yeah very very fun uh fun to cast this spell and succeed with it right finally level 9 spells there's not very many to choose from foresight is good uh, it's not a concentration spell so uh, i would say that i mean if you don't want to use shape change which is definitely probably the most powerful spell it's definitely the most powerful spell that you can have access to because you can just legitimately become one of those powerful challenging 17 to 20 creatures and those creatures are definitely, in most cases, more powerful than you. More hit points, uh, very powerful attacks, more damage. Uh, and just like a bag of hit points, right? Um, uh, it's a concentration, doesn't last very long, but it's a very powerful combat buff. And if it fails, you still have access to your lower level spells. So you can conjure animals, conjure beasts, conjure fey. Uh, if you don't want to do that... Foresight is sort of like a good way of, even though it's not on the list, I'm just still gonna mention it, uh, because if you touch yourself, uh, no pun intended, uh, I know what you mean, uh, you give yourself basically advantage on all attack rolls, ability checks and saving throws, that means all of your saving throws are gonna be made with advantage, giving you more chance of succeeding, taking half damage, avoiding traps and whatnot. Uh, resisting some type of mental attacks from monsters and additionally other creatures have disadvantage in attack rolls against against you the target for the duration so basically if you cast foresight on yourself um, you can sort of give yourself an additional layer of defense for maintaining a concentration on, of one on one of these lower level spells such as animal shapes conjure fey conjure animals stuff like that so yeah definitely a very very powerful spell uh, in itself I would still say that I would probably still have shape change prepared instead of foresight just for the fact that it's more powerful even though it's a concentration but I mean a lot of challenge rating 17 to 20 creatures have proficiency in uh, in constitution saving throws they have like double digit bonuses and uh, shape change allows you to maintain the st uh, uh, your game statistics are replaced, but you also retain all of your skill and saving throw proficiencies in addition, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, you, you cannot use legendary actions later. Like, you have, uh, you have, uh, you, you sort of like, you have, you, compared to true polymorph, this spell gives you more, because you can retain some of your own capabilities, instead of just completely relying on capabilities of the creature that you're turning into. The only limiting factor of this, again, one hour duration, and the fact that you need to see the creature. Uh, yeah, so the new form can be any creature, blah blah blah, but you need to have seen the creature at least once. So yeah, I mean, at this point you would probably at least see some of the challenge rating, like challenge rating 15 plus creatures. If you haven't, take foresight, it's very good. Advantage on all ability checks, attack roll, saving throws, and this every, everybody against you, every, every attack roll against you has disadvantage. It's, I mean, it's, it's just good. Like, all level 9 spells are good. Uh, with that said, true resurrection, it costs, like, 
a, a, a crap ton of amount of gold. Like, it's just crazy how much gold it costs. 25,000. But, you can revive a two centuries old, a two centuries dead creature. And even if you don't have their body, the spell will still work. The creature could even be undead at some point. It will still revive it in its, in its, in its like, uh, un-undead, non-undead form. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's sort of like a tongue twister. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a 9th level spell. What do you want? It's expensive, but it's very, very powerful. And yeah, that's about it for spells. In terms of progression, I would say, I mean, we went over the features. You know what, it, what they do. This is a single class uh, character, a single class build. Uh, you take At level 4, you take the resilient constitution feat. You bring your constitution to 18. Now you're proficient with it. So your mod modifier from constitution is plus four with a plus two from uh, from your proficiency bonus. That's going to rise uh, as you level up. At level 12, you uh, at level eight, you get Warcaster feat uh, on top of being uh, proficient in constitution saving throws. Now, every time you get damaged and have to roll those constitution saving throws to maintain concentration, you have advantage. You can... Uh, cast uh, spells on attacks of opportunity and you ignore you can you don't have to have your free hands for somatic components at level 12 i would uh, just max out constitution so 20 constitution uh, you now have almost zero chance of failing a standard dc 10 concentration saving throw which depends on your level proficiency bonus right uh, at level 12 your proficiency bonus is uh, I mean, even at level 12, I think, uh, let me see, if I'm not mistaken, your proficiency is plus 4, right? Yeah, it's plus 4 from that, so plus 4 from that, plus 5, because your constitution is 20, that's plus 9, and you will roll a minimum of 1. Uh, a natural 1 on saving throws, there's no such thing as like, a na uh, as like an automatic failure. So yeah, the minimum you can roll at level 12 with a plus 2, with like plus 2 to constitution is 10. So that means you have zero chance of failing those standard DC 10 concentration saving throws. And also, depending on your level and proficiency bonus, so meaning uh, when you get higher levels, your proficiency becomes plus 5 and finally plus 6 at level 17, uh, you, will need you will need to get damaged for a lot of damage, relatively speaking, uh, to have any chance of failing the save. Because inflicting 22 to 26 damage, even at higher levels, is oftentimes you that's the amount of damage you you take from like one hit. Yeah, I mean, some monsters hit higher, hit more, but with like with a with a plus uh, plus uh, plus 11 to Constitution saving throws, meaning that the minimum you will roll is 12. Yeah, I mean, you you have to take a lot of damage. And also make sure to always have Absorb Elements ready to prevent some of the massive elemental AoE damage from, like, Dragon Breath or whatever, f Fireball, Storm, Firestorm, wh who knows? Like, the AoE damage, which is going to inflict a lot of elemental damage, uh, you need to half all of that damage to give yourself a better chance of succeeding on the Constitution saving throw. And finally... At the ability score improvement at level 16 and 19, I would say just max out your wisdom. At level 19, uh, your, your spell save DC is finally going to be 19. Uh, this is gonna help a lot when casting those polymorphs uh, to burn through the legendary resistances, or when just casting Feeble Mind, an 8th level spell which just... Uh, which can render a lot of uh, high challenge rating monsters near useless against your party. With that said, let's just quickly go back to this character and see what it can actually do. Um, in essence, if the DM lets you choose which beasts to summon with your Conjure Animals spell, uh, here are some examples. I'm gonna give you like two examples. Uh, there's a lot more, like a lot of these beasts are super, super good. But that, let's just say... Uh, you take uh, con you take raptors, right? So uh, raptors on their own. Uh, let me let me go there. They have like ten hit points. Uh, <clears throat> give me a second. Where is the raptor? There we go. So yeah, they have ten, ten hit points on their own. They do have pack tactics, meaning with the multi attack, like they will attack twice for advantage. But that's compensated by them having very little hit points. With 
your features uh, allowing for 11 temporary hit points that's at, that's at level 6 so 5 plus 6 is 11 and the mighty summoner feature which gives 6 additional hit points because the it's 2 hit points per hit die and raptor has 3 hit die so 3 times 2 is 6 the raptor is gonna have instead of 10 hit points it's gonna have 27 hit points and all of its damage is gonna, damage is gonna be magical so all of the immunities and resistances to non-magic damage you don't care and your DPR with this thing is gonna be a lot. Because these things, like, on average, when they hit, they deal, like, 10 damage on average. Um, now you have 8 creatures, all dealing 10 damage on average, all attacking if, if, all, if, all, if, all, if both attacks hit. But both of their attacks are gonna be made with advantage, because they have pack tactics. So now you're looking at 80, 80 damage per round... From monsters, each monster having 27 hit points, and each monster dealing 20 uh, dealing magical damage. That's a lot of damage. That's that's a lot of damage from like a, a sixth level character every single round. One spell, granted, it's a concentration, but I, like, tell me what other can do can do that much damage at this level? Sure, you can do do that much damage in a round or two, but you can do this for like extended period of time as as long as you can maintain concentration on uh, that conjure animals and conjure animals it, it lasts like decently long so yeah you have plenty of time to use these raptors as much as possible but let's not even consider the damage like damage is oftentimes the damage per round is the fact that people focus too much on to let's focus on something else let's take for example giant frogs I'm gonna take giant frogs and constrictor snakes because because both work in a similar way. Uh, first and foremost, the snakes. The constrictor snakes, which I've used in the intro story of this video, um, they have uh, they they have nothing but the uh, two attack action options, but they have a little bit more hit points. So that means you will be able to give them like uh, 11 hit points with your temporary. Uh, and then on top of that, they will have four additional, so that's like uh, 28 hit points, similar to raptors, uh, who have 27. But, uh, if they constrict the target, the target is grappled and restrained. Uh, that means the target's movement speed is zero, the target's attack rolls uh, have disadvantage, the target's... Uh, I think it like automatically fails some type of saving throw. Uh, dexterity saving throw is like uh, automatically failed due to restraint condition. Uh, and the attack rolls against the creature have advantage. So the first time one of these eight snakes, which you cast with your conjure animals, restricts, constricts a target, restrains it, all of the other attacks from the snakes and your, uh, um, your uh, party members are gonna be made with advantage. So, this is a major, major thing. And also, uh, the escape DC is fairly high. It's a DC 14. It's, it's, it's not very easy to pass this, uh, this DC to escape the grappled condition. Now, giant uh, frogs, they are similar but yet different. Uh, their their uh, bonus to hit is slightly worse. The snakes have plus 4, the frog has plus 3, but... That doesn't even matter that much because the bite of the of the frog also inflicts the same grappled uh, and restrained condition upon the target. Sure, neither the constrictor nor the frog can uh, attack any other target while uh, with this attack uh, uh, option. But uh, and also the frogs have a less uh, lower escape DC. But also, I mean. The same kind of restrained grapple condition giving advantage to all other attack rolls and the creature has disadvantage on their own attack rolls and whatnot. But on top of that you have this swallow attack option which can completely envelop the creature, deal additional acid damage, not a lot, but the creature actually is blinded now on top of being restrained as well. So, I mean... Uh, yeah, the creature can still attack from inside and kill the frog, but the frog itself, let, let, I'm not, I didn't even tell them the most ridiculous part. Armor class is low, sure, the frog can, will probably get hit, but on its own, the frog has 18 hit points, 4 hit die, 
That means with the 6th level feature, the Mighty Summoner, all of these dice are gonna give it 8 additional hit points. And if you give it uh, the Bear Spirit Totem, 11 temporary hit points, the frog is gonna have 37 hit points. And all of this damage is gonna be magical. It's... It's just, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, the amount of, obviously, first and foremost, you're gonna deal damage with this period. Because if you hit, you don't care about immunities and resistances to non-magic damage because your damage is magical. But on top of this, oh, like a lot of these beasts have these restrained grapple. Like the wolf has, uh, the wolf can knock a creature prone. There's all sorts of stuff you can do with these monsters. And this is just like a, couple of things i i don't want to go through all of these beasts because the video is already almost two hours and uh it's gonna take another hour th to go through all of these examples but this is the kind of stuff you can do if the dm just lets you choose which beasts to summon with the conjure animal spells at the very least i repeat again if you use the conjure animals spell ask the dm to let you use the creatures that you choose, right? So, if you choose the conjure animals and you choose eight beasts of challenge rating one quarter or lower, tell the DM, come on, don't be, you know, like, let me at least, like, you choose the beasts, but here's the list of beasts of challenge rating one quarter or lower. There's a lot of beasts to choose from. Give me anything of this. Because, sure, these lower challenge rating beasts, these ones can at least be useful, but they're weaker. Most of these are kind of shit because their challenge rating is zero. They have like next to no, no hit points and their attack rolls are super shit. They do they deal low damage. So, yeah, I would say the mo the, the the least your DM can do at least if you if you if you pick this option. This is I'm going to tell you this is the best option because of the action economy because just of the sheer amount of attacks, the sheer amount of hit points that you can field on the battlefield this is the best option um in in a majority of cases i would say you can skip this one because a lot of these half challenge rating beasts don't really have more hit points than the half quarter like the quarter challenge rating beasts like if you, if you check for example ape ape has like 19 hit points sure that's a little bit higher but giant goat 19 not really much reef shark uh okay 22 but it's 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 like uh uh, it's like it's it's not it's not a very very high uh, high level uh, high. It, it's like a aqu aquatic feature, a, aquatic beast. Yeah, I mean, definitely definitely ask a DM to do that. With that said, um, I'm gonna repeat once again. Uh, if you want to play in my game, or uh, I'm, okay, first and foremost, if you want to play in my game, the special offer, the summer deal, is up for six more days. If you want to get your hands uh, on these files, especially the word file, but also the PDF of this uh, character, which is granted not fully done, but this is just a template for you to use and change. This is an editable PDF, meaning that if you download this, you will be able to edit this to your uh, liking. So you will be able to change all of these things to your preference. Uh, head over to my Patreon, uh, pledge the Magical Secrets tier, you will get access to all of the PDF and Word files. Uh, this thing over here needs to be changed, I'm in the process of uh, retiring the Facebook group and moving everything onto a Discord server. I still haven't figured out the Patreon bot, there's some kind of problem with it, I don't know why, but I'm gonna... I'm gonna jump on this uh, immediately after I finish this video. So yeah, you will get access to my patron only f uh, Discord server. And obviously you will get all the lower tier benefits every once in a while. Uh, you can request a video, you can request a character idea. You will get shout outs and all of that other stuff. So yeah, basically that's about it. Um, video is done. Almost two hours. Uh, apologies for <laughs> taking almost two hours of your life. But I think, I mean, if you're new to the game, you kind of like need all of this stuff anyway. Um, with that said, um, Min Max Munch King out and uh, talk to you soon.